Hello, and welcome to the speaker series, New Thinking at Berkeley Haas, Business, Economics, and Inclusion. I'm Laura Tyson, Distinguished Professor of the Graduate School and the former Dean of UC Berkeley Haas School of Business. I also am currently serving as the co-chair of Governor Newsom's Council of Economic Advisors. I mentioned that to make sure that we recognize I'm speaking solely for myself as an independent economist and not for the state of California and not for the governor. I am absolutely thrilled and delighted to welcome today Dr. Lisa Cook. Dr. Lisa Cook is a professor of economics and international relations at Michigan State University. She is an alumna of the economics PhD program at Berkeley. It turns out that we have many uh, parallels in our life in terms of people we've dealt with at Berkeley, and it's just a real pleasure to have her with us today. We share a common history of serving on President's uh, Council of Economic Advisors. She was a senior economist at the council during the Obama administration 2011 to 2012. I chaired the Council of Economic Advisors during the Clinton administration. Uh, Lisa last year was also working as a member of President Biden's transition team and we had an opportunity to work together again. Uh, Lisa is an advocate for increasing diversity in the field of uh, economics, a topic that's also near and dear to my heart. She's a director of the American Economics Association Summer Training Program. She focuses on how do we get undergraduates from underrepresented groups who are interested in economics to pursue that field, a fascinating, important area. Her academic research is wide ranging. It is, uh, it's, it's really inspirational. She has done uh, work on, um, the uh, an emerging market economy. She's done work on the Eurozone. She's done work on international economic issues in general. Uh, she has done uh, path-breaking work, which you're gonna hear about today on entrepreneurship, innovation, and also the cost to the economy, to the economy of longstanding uh, structural barriers to gender, to, uh, to race, to ethnicity. Uh, very, very important uh, research, very original research. Um, while the focus of the research is historical, I'd like to start by taking a moment to acknowledge how much of the issues that Lisa focuses on are with us today. Gender inequities, racial inequities, ethnic inequities. These are tremendously costly to our society, to the individuals who are harmed by them, but also to our aggregate economy. And of course, they are uh, deeply disturbing. Uh, between the police shootings and the recent attacks on Asians and Asian Americans, we know, we know that we are still struggling as a society with race-related violence. And this was brought horrifically back to us as if we needed a reminder uh, this week uh, by what has happened in Atlanta. And it's on everyone's mind. So I thought that we should take a moment before we begin today's discussion to inflect on these injustices, to honor and remember the victims and to recognize the impact that violence has had on so many in our community. So just a moment of silence, please. Thank you. And now let's get started. I'm gonna turn uh, over to uh, Dr. Cook. Um, I should have referred to her as Dr. Cook. I was referring to her as Lisa because I've come to really just in a very short That's period fine. of time, I feel like a friend. Um, she will make a presentation uh, that's approximately 30 minutes, and then we will go to a Q&A period for about uh, 15 minutes. So I encourage you, if you have a question, uh, uh, they will be appearing to me and I will be moderating questions. So. Turning over to Lisa or Dr. Cook. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Laura, for that very generous introduction. The cost of racism. I am just delighted to be a part of this new thinking at Berkeley Haas series and am delighted to be back with my friends at Berkeley. In economics, we typically calculate harm from discrimination based on the intended group. 
Sometimes the outcomes are wages. Sometimes they're educational achievement, levels of educational achievement, health outcomes, um, other life outcomes. Uh, sometimes they have to do with racist redevelopment policies that deliberately destroyed black neighborhoods and highways during the period of urban renewal. There's a lot of research on that these days. Sometimes it has to do with housing outcomes or redlining, uh, car and home purchases uh, or sales, job callback, segregation, violence, credit, police stops. There are many different outcomes. I would argue that this perspective and approach are too narrow. There are negative externalities for the entire economy and the presence of racial and ethnic discrimination. Macroeconomists have largely stayed silent on matters related to distribution, inequality, and discrimination. There was a tempest in a teapot uproar when then chair of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, Janet Yellen, gave a speech on inequality at the Boston Fed in October 2014. Many of her critics said the Fed chair does not discuss issues related to distribution. Well, it turned out not only had Fed economists been doing research on inequality for decades, former Fed chairs had given talks on inequality itself. Wow. Since that time, even the IMF, another institution full of macroeconomists who were not used to considering distri distributional effects of monetary, physical, and banking policy, has increasingly discussed inequality. Having led the Harvard team helping to negotiate Rwanda's first post-genocide IMF program with Jeffrey Sachs, I, as a macroeconomist, understand the importance of considering distribution. So here, in that case, it was not just Tutsis and Hutus. It was women. Many of the victims, if not most of the victims of the genocide were men. And you had a, uh, a much larger share of women in the economy than you had before, and they couldn't legally have bank accounts. So you had this sector of the economy that was now very important that had been discriminated against in the past, but they had to be the ones organizing the economy and leading the economy. So it wasn't just an ethnic racial divide it was a gender divide in the economy. So we really had to pay attention to distribution. Coke 2014 measures the cost of racism in patents or lost innovation. In Coke 2014, I show that threats to the rule of law can undermine innovation, economic activity, and the rise in living standards. Race-related violence in the United States increased significantly between 1870 and 1940. Segregation laws peaked in 1908, 1928, and 1933. Race riots peaked in 1919. Lynchings peaked in 1892 and 1893. And these are proxies for the absence of rule of law in estimation. And this is the key graph from that uh, paper. Um, you have uh, in red the black patents, uh, those uh, patents per million for African Americans, and then you have white patents in blue, and you have uh, those are also patents per million, and the axis that is appropriate for reading the series for white patents is the left-hand side, and the right-hand side is for patents per million for blacks. Definitely different orders of magnitude, but as a macroeconomist, I was really interested in the direction of activity. And what you can see is that, well, this isn't convergence. They were largely moving in the same direction until 1900. And then you have this massive divergence. And this divergence is non-recovering. You see this uh, big permanent shift uh, between those two lines going forward. So this is the uh, seminal graph from the paper. What were the main findings from that paper? They were the following. Violence diminishes innovation and economic activity with persistent effects. 
1899 is still the peak year for patenting per capita for African Americans. That's even using 2010 patent data. Lynchings affect patents of African Americans significantly. Segregation laws, and here I want to be very clear about the laws that I'm using. I'm using all of the laws enacted to restrict the activities of any ethnic and racial minorities, whether they were African American or Asian or uh, Latino, uh, all racial minorities. And the idea was that I was trying to get a sense of the level of racial animus, the, the extent of racial animus in the economy at the time. Those laws hurt the most valuable patents at the time, and those were electrical patents. This is the period 1870 to 1940. The missing patents were equivalent to a medium-sized European country at that time. And again, that was in the period 1870 to 1940. So that was really significant. So if we think about the counterfactual, what would have happened had white inventors, the other inventors in the data set, been subjected to the same kinds of violence? Well, this is the graph that tells us that. In blue, we have the actual uh, patenting change, and that is, uh, you can see that it's not that volatile, kind of flat, um, but if you look at the red line, it's much more volatile and it's much more negative overall. And what this tells us, and this is the predicted white patenting, uh, if subjected to uh, similar types of violence. Uh, what this tells us is that there would have been little business investment because uh, business investment depends on innovation and roughly 20% of GDP is attributed to business investment. So that would have been a lot lower and uh, GDP ostensibly would have been a lot lower as well. So we can think of this as one of the costs of uh, racism. So what are we losing because of many missing African-Americans with respect to living standards and with respect to innovation? My co-author and I uh, in 2018 estimated that this was equivalent to 4.4% of GDP per capita. And this was both women and African-Americans not participating in the innovation economy. Mm -hmm. This is compared to 2.7% of GDP per capita for, for women. And this is a uh, calculation that Hunt et al. Uh, innovated and that we, uh, we just implemented for African-Americans as well. So this is consistent with the findings of Shea, Hurst, Jones, and Clinow 2018. Uh, by the way, uh, Chang Tai Shea was my housemate at Berkeley. Uh, mm -hmm. And what they estimate is or what they do is to analyze gender and racial uh, distribution, the racial and gender distribution for highly skilled occupations over the last 50 years. And what they show is that a change in occupational distribution since 1960 suggests that substantial pool, uh, uh, that a substantial pool of innately talented women and African Americans in 1960 not pursuing their comparative advantage leads to uh, serious costs in the economy. This misallocation of talent affects aggregate productivity in the economy. A quarter of growth in aggregate output from 1960 to 2010 can be explained by an improved allocation of talent. And that's also 40% of aggregate for productivity. So this is huge. These aren't small uh, mm -hmm. estimates, small shares of the economy. Peterson and Mann um, in a Citibank study from 2020 estimate that this cost, the cost of racism is $13 trillion. This is $13 trillion lost in potential business revenue from discriminatory lending to black entrepreneurs. And that is associated with about 6.1 million jobs not generated. So this is huge. This is a part of the uh, New York Times column that I, uh, that I penned that is the uh, motivation for this talk. So we've estimated the cost. These costs are huge. The question is, what do we do about this? 
Of course, the response to that is that we eliminate barriers wherever they exist, especially related to the rate of arrival of ideas. So what else can be done? So I have a few uh, policy prescriptions that I would uh, suggest. Learn about and address racism, encourage anti-racist behavior, policies and practices. Uh, for example, the American Economic Association adopted a code of conduct recently to address this behavior. Uh, reverse California's Prop uh, 209. Uh, Berkeley grad student Zach Bleemer is showing that it significantly diminished opportunities and mobility for black students, Hispanic students, especially in uh, tech. And there, uh, one might suggest adopting Texas style targets of taking the top 10%, for example, of high school students to widen the opportunities. Mm -hmm. Improve the pipeline, especially STEM, including exposure to invention uh, in the way that Chetty et al. 2019 would suggest. So if you don't know that paper, the paper uh, suggests that exposure to invention is associated with better life outcomes, including uh, wages and education. Enhance mentoring and generally improve workplace environment, including reporting and prosecuting racial and gender harassment and misconduct and, address, and addressing racial bias. There are some other policy prescriptions that are a bit more global. Release the report on white supremacist groups. So this report was one that was produced by Homeland Security in 2009, but, uh, or prepared by Homeland Security at that time, but it was not released upon the urging of uh, some um, policymakers. And I really think that that needs to be better known about white supremacist groups and these hate crimes uh, should be prosecuted and there should be other fundamental uh, police re reforms. And I would argue, just as Laura was mentioning, that uh, these are more urgent now than ever that these hate crimes are addressed. Mm -hmm. International cooperation is also needed. Um, I would also suggest that uh, military equipment uh, should be returned to the federal government, that uh, community policing should be adopted more broadly, that the police forces should be uh, demilitarized. Uh, and what we know from other experiments, say in Camden, New Jersey, that um, there was a, uh, a dismantling of the police force and homicides were down 50%. There are experiments, including in uh, just next door to Berkeley in San Francisco where teams of mental health specialists were used. And this brought down the violent encounters between the public and the police. And again, a focus on community policing might be useful as well. Um, obviously congressional legislation could help. Um, and I could say more about that if we have uh, more time, but certainly from this, uh, from this research, uh, the Success Act and the IDEA Act in Congress to measure who's participating in, in innovation is something that uh, I think is a positive development. Improve opportunities for commercialization, say through the SBAs, SBAR and STTR uh, program, and that is registered in a 2020 report for the Department of Energy. Of course, one might want to address the racial wealth gap and that might be done in several different ways. What we know from recent uh, research, from recent data um, is that uh, the gap between black households and white households is really large with respect to net worth. And we, we know that in the Boston area and uh, the median black household has $8 in net worth. And if you think about it, that would probably get you a, uh, a tall order of a coffee at Starbucks and that's it. This is something that uh, Darity and Hamilton have been working on in various cities around the country. Okay. And this is not enough to weather unexpected events like a pandemic. So this is something that has to be urgently addressed. So far, I've been talking about things that are fairly piecemeal. 
But I think this calls for, uh, this time calls for a set of big ideas. And what we know about social movements is that protest often turns into policy, often, and that's not automatic, uh, and then that could lead to structural change needed to address systemic issues. So the continuation of or reinvigoration of the war on poverty, maybe it actually needs a new uh, name. That could be one uh, big idea, but we have to think about fundamental resets. And have we seen this before? Yes. And if you've been on Twitter, you know that I have talked about uh, my cousin Floyd McKissick and his experiment before. Um, here he is pictured with uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and others who were leading the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Uh, Floyd was one of the speakers at the March on Washington as was Martin Luther King Jr. And um, at the end of his life, you know that Martin Luther King Jr. was leading the Poor People's Campaign, which was, uh, which was his focus uh, before he was assassinated and with the Memphis uh, sanitation workers. Uh, Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott King pushed for universal basic income and an increase in the living wage. So my cousin Floyd McKissick Sr. dreamed of and built an entire city, Soul City, North Carolina, to address wow racial income, wealth, and financial gaps. People moved there from urban areas, including Har Harlem, with limited job opportunities and in acute environmental racism. So this was in the middle of North Carolina, rural North Carolina. Um, he thought, just like I uh, thought many decades later, that uh, technology and innovation were going to be fundamental to creating these good jobs. So the anchor business there that came there first was IBM. And it was a major component for uh, a plan of job creation. There's a podcast about it and a new book that has just come out by Thomas Healy in uh, 2021. Wow. And uh, here are just some of the advertisements for uh, Soul City. It was to be a, a black majority, but not exclusively a uh, black town, but it was supposed to provide good jobs for everybody who moved and lived there. This is uh, the water treatment plant, a plan for the water treatment plant. A lot of the infrastructure that was built still provides uh, services to rural North Carolina. And there, uh, Floyd is pictured in some of the uh, advertisements for uh, Soul City, North Carolina. There are other big ideas, uh, including reparations, uh, the work of Coates or Darity and Mullen, uh, job guarantee, something else that Sandy Darity has worked on, baby bonds, something that Sandy Darity and Derek Hamilton have uh, <laughs> done. Uh, but my basic point here is that blue sky thinking is absolutely uh, necessary and to be relevant to address the systemic issues the big ideas must address structural racism and racial disparities. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Join me at, at Dr. Lisa D. Cook for more of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, I uh, it, it's a very powerful presentation. I, I want to start just by emphasizing, I'm going to go right to the Q&A when I see some questions, but I want to emphasize, again, the basic structure of what you've done here. You, you started with, there are externalities, there are costs on our entire society and our entire economy, and they are substantial costs because of these barriers. Mm -hmm. they, they, they have personal effects on the individual, on the family, on the community, but they have mm -hmm. macro, aggregate, big effects. And I, I think I really want to emphasize that in mm -hmm. this discussion. And the mm -hmm. second thing is I, I want to point out to the audience an appreciation for to do the kind of research you've done, those amazing graphs which show mm -hmm. the effect of violence and show mm -hmm. the effect of uh, these kinds of discrimination on innovation. There wasn't a data set to do that. There was not a data. You actually had to put together. You, you mm -hmm. told me that the patent information does not come with any information about uh, race. So mm -hmm. you, you actually had to figure out 
uh, and add up over years. You mm -hmm. had to develop and you did develop a tool which actually can be used by researchers uh, for other projects, uh, a, uh, a lynching database, uh, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we know that violence does have effects. So mm -hmm. let's actually get a database which we'll, we can use in our research. So mm -hmm. I just want mm -hmm. to emphasize the importance of both thinking about the economy-wide effects and also the fact that this is really, you've developed some very important data for, for researchers to continue to, to work on. So um, let me uh, start with, with that. Um, and since we, uh, I haven't seen a question yet, let me just start with an obvious one, which is how did you come up with the idea in the first place of mm -hmm. that 2014 paper thinking about racial violence and rates of patenting. So ha that's that's at a very uh, it's an original. No one had done that kind of research before. Okay, so you, mm -hmm. I just like a little bit of how you got to that in terms of all the work you had been doing. Well, thank you for that that question. I was in Russia writing my dissertation, doing work on uh, Central and Eastern Europe as you had done in the past, and um, and you know I was interviewing. Uh, entrepreneurs, managers, and bankers for my dissertation. And the question was, could you have a market-based economy and market-based banking system, allocation of credit, to emerge from the Soviet Union? And there were a lot of things that weren't available then, like credit scores or credit histories. So uh, how would you allocate credit if you didn't know how to judge these products? Uh, or these uh, projects. So uh, that's what I was looking at. Could this ed endogenously evolve? So in these interviews, they talk to me as much as I talk to them. And one common theme, one common question that kept arising was, why doesn't innovation come to Russia? We have intellectual property rights protected in law. We you know, we, we have inventors, why don't we see innovation happening? And, you know, I, I've said it's a really good question, but like a good graduate student should, I said, <laughs> I've got to finish my dissertation and, oh my <laughs> and I'll get back to you on that. Um, so, so it kept bugging me though, because at the time the conventional wisdom was, if you have the intellectual property rights environment right, you should see innovation come about. Well, I would argue it, it would take more than that. So the question was, was there an historical experiment that could inform us, that could inform the Russians about what was happening in their country at the time? So I thought about it, well, maybe inventors. So we saw inventors in the late 19th century who were white and black, uh, at least white and black. And one of them was uh, shocked with these uh, violent events, uh, segregation laws. Uh, lynchings and race riots. And the other group was largely uh, not affected by that or not affected as much by that. And the intellectual property rights regime remained the same for both of them. So we have our experiment. Now there's just, uh, well, a couple of flies in the ointment and you <laughs> articulated a few of them. Um, I thought there was a ready uh, list of patents uh, that African-Americans had, uh, inventions that African-Americans had patented. Uh, there was no such list uh, and race is not recorded on uh, patent records. So I had to try to figure out what the universe of uh, patentees uh, was. And that took a lot of effort. Um, I started with surveys from 1900 to 1913, but that particular survey by Henry Baker didn't include the first black patent in 1821. So I had to ex expand it in, in both directions to be able to cover 1870 to 1940. And I had to find lynchings. The lynching data are quite imperfect. Uh, I've been trying to clean those up. That's, uh, that's the work that you were referring to. And uh, race riots, I think, were fairly uh, easy to find relatively. But it took about a year to establish each uh, data set on, on, on average. So uh, it just took a, a lot of work. But what, what I show, and when I give this uh, seminar, the folks who were most engaged 
are the people that we used to talk to, uh, Laura, the people from uh, Central, Central and Eastern Europe and from China, uh, especially from Russia and Ukraine, actually, mm-hmm. because they can immediately see that it takes a lot more infrastructure like personal security protection, the rule of law, protecting the rule of law to be able to produce innovation, not just uh, property rights that are protected on paper. So I, I think it is something that transcends the lessons of this research, uh, transcend both space and uh, time. And I'm uh, grateful to have been able to contribute to the research in that way. So I, I want to point out again for the audience that the comparative perspective here, the, the gl- starting with a question, which actually comes in a slightly different societal setting, and then thinking about um, and using history as well. So it, it's, a, it's a really brilliant bringing together uh, of the externality argument, a system question, what was wrong? What was not holding back uh, innovation in Russia? And then looking at this experiment. By the way, I, w- I will go to the first question, but in work, I've been involved in some work on the aggregate effects of uh, gender disparities. And this has been primarily in conjunction with the World Economic Forum, but also mm-hmm. with the McKinsey Global Institute. And one, what one, the issue of just violence, personal security, the security mm-hmm. issue to uh, the allocate to where women go to work. What so it, again? It goes to your point about what was missing in Russia, and then you sort of found it by looking at this historical violence and personal security. Really, have an effect on how people decide: can they patent? Can, where they're going to take jobs? All of that. It's it's very very important. Very very important. Let me turn to a question that came in that really is on your policy prescription list. So, <laughs> and that is the question of uh, reparations, because um, the question of of how one might do that, how one might structure that. Uh, the feasibility. What's what's the best thinking on this, Elisa? How should we think about this? That's a that's a really good question. I'll answer one of your last questions uh, first. The best thinking, I think, is the thinking of Darity and Mullen from here to equality, and it is just a comprehensive tour de force with respect to the history of reparations and the many different dimensions of uh, executing that policy. The unfortunate thing is that it's, it's kind of the only game in town. Um, you know, it is so expansive and so extensive and so recent, um, so comprehensive that there's nothing else really to, um, to refer to. So, so okay. you know, uh, they're, they're my friends. So, so <laughs> I appreciate that they've done this work. Uh, but, but I think there has to be uh, broader thinking about, uh, about alternatives, uh, about how to implement this. There are several experiments going on now, one of them being the Evanston uh, experiment with uh, reparations, and uh, there are other experiments with um, with with towns in the U.S. Uh, wow. implementing this. But you know, they're they're not. Uh, you know, they're scaling up is certainly going to be a difficult question. One thing I do support is um, HR forty, which would put in place a commission to study this. And okay. I think that's absolutely what needs to be done. Uh, you know, yep. again, I think um, it, it's it's difficult not to comment on a particular plan because there could be many different plans to achieve the kind of reparations, for example, that uh, Derry and Mullen are, are suggesting. Okay, but that's that's certainly one thing that I would uh, would uh, pursue. No, no harm in having a commission to study this. Let me ask, it's a related question and it comes up with the, the uh, this, again, I think on the policy prescription list, but obviously related, there's lots of, California's doing this now in Stockton. What about a basic income approach? It, it isn't 
it's not a reparations approach, but it is a kind of notion of, let, and it could even have a basic wealth approach, I suppose, to it. What do you, uh, what about that as a way uh, to handle some of the, the issues? Uh, the basic income information seems to be showing that mm -hmm. uh, recipients actually uh, are more likely to uh, to take a job and to get an education mm -hmm. skill to get that mm -hmm. job. So it actually promotes a uh, better allocation of labor, better allocation mm -hmm. of education. So what about basic mm -hmm. income or basic wealth? <laughs> right, right. Um, well, with respect to basic income proposals, certainly the research is looking promising, whether mm -hmm. we're talking about Switzerland or uh, Damon Jones's work on uh, UBI in Alaska from the pipeline, uh, from the proceeds from oil and gas. So, so I think that they are suggesting that you don't see this decline in labor force participation that sort of the, the critics would suggest, uh, but that you see uh, many of the beneficial outcomes that one would anticipate. So I would say that the research is suggesting that um, this could be uh, really powerful, a really powerful uh, tool for addressing part of the uh, racial income gap, not the wealth gap, but not the, the wealth gap. Income, yeah. Right, right, the income gap. But I would argue again, if I don't think we can think about these proposals in isolation. So mm -hmm. what's the what's the alternative, or what's going to go along with that? Would baby bonds go along with uh, basic income or uh, another experiment like Soul City. So I think that, or okay. another set of experiments like Soul City. So, or, 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 or another one also, Lisa, you, you, talked, you, you talked about one of those uh, studies that looks at the misallocation of labor, that essentially uh, mm -hmm. women and racial minorities are not allocating into the top level occupations, if you kind of look at their share of the workforce right. and then their share of those occupations, they're way, they're way off. Yeah. So um, mm -hmm. I guess one, one question that I would have there is you, you want to make sure that you said it, a lot of things matter. So a basic mm -hmm. income may be important, but also figuring out a way through the educational system to to break down those structural barriers. So you see representation mm -hmm. in high income occupations and mm -hmm. high income sectors. So I know you work on that as well, because in economics, you're working on that. So right, right. talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that as a complementary policy as well. Well, you know, again, there's some great research at Berkeley being done on this. Uh, Zach Bleemer in the econ department is working on this, looking at, the long-term effects of Prop 209, which passed when I was uh, a student, a graduate student at Berkeley. And what it shows is that this had a really detrimental effect, not only on the educational outcomes of the people who, are, uh, who were immediately affected, but also intergenerationally. And uh, this is, uh, this could be a real drain on the tech sector, which uses Berkeley and Stanford as its main uh, places of recruitment. So not only, I mean, it's, it's not a surprise that we see very few people in management who are, uh, who are African-American at tech companies, uh, you know, poor participation in the innovation economy, only 1% uh, of founders receiving venture capital are African-American, 0.2% are uh, black women. So um, I think that we, we see the pipeline, if we're talking about the pipeline and the networks that come from being at Berkeley, for example, having been severed by Prop 209, I think it needs to be repealed. And the same is true for the California law that mandates that public companies have at least one woman on the board. And we know the evidence from Europe suggests that these are better performing companies after this happens. And I would suggest that that be extended to racial and ethnic minorities. And I think that uh, in the future, in the near future, that has to be at least two women. Uh, so I would seek proposals like that to uh, provide representation, uh, serious representation and 
diverse ideas. This is, I mean, I think this is my, my main point. Uh-huh. The flow of ideas has got to be unleashed. And, you know, between racism and sexism, we have, uh, we have a big problem. We have uh, a problem with respect to the flow of ideas. Uh, in one paper, I showed that uh, co-ed teams are more productive than single sex female or single sex uh, male teams. That means that CEOs are leaving money on the table if they're allowing this kind of discrimination to go forward. So I think that we can be much more productive and raise living standards if we incorporate more uh, women, more minorities into uh, the innovation economy. So I'm, I'm struck by and, and optimistic about the growing number of uh, businesses at the pressure of their shareholders and the pressures of their customers and sometimes the pressure of their employees if they have enough, the Mm -hmm. pressure coming from all of those stakeholders on businesses to actually review seriously their human resource strategy Mm -hmm. and actually to have to report in a transparent way on Mm -hmm. what they're doing. So Mm -hmm. uh, I know that the, 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 new head of the SEC in uh, under uh, President uh, Biden, uh, Gary Gensler, will will continue to, this has been an issue of we shall require what kinds of information shall we require (laughs) from companies about what they are doing here. And of course that forces them to actually look, you know, there was a, this is not a gender discrimination issue, but a few years ago, there was a very well announced uh, survey that Matt Benhoff did at the request of his employees because they said there was wage disparity based on gender. He said, no, there isn't, but I'll do a, I'll do a search and see if there is. And he came back and he said, oh my God, there right. is. And right, we are going right. to, cur- right. So basically you, I, I'm, when I, in my optimistic moments, I think the pressure coming from stakeholders in society at this point is going to lead businesses to do much more here to address these kinds of issues. But I don't know, what do you, what do you think? Maybe I'm a big over. I agree, I I agree. And you know, it just, we're economists and I just cry when we're not at the frontier of maximizing these inputs. We have these inputs (laughs) and and, and what, what we're saying to the CEOs is for them to be good stewards of that talent yeah and if they're not being not only should the ceo be held accountable every Mm -hmm. single supervisor every single manager should be held accountable for not maximizing the talent that is available yes if you you understand profit maximization like i shouldn't have to tell you that (laughs) that's the goal that's the goal. Well, maybe what we've we found out is that basically through research like yours, we now can say to the management, you know, this is really costly. It's a big cost to you and it's right. a big cost to society. So right. the evidence has become more and more powerful that mm-hmm. there's a huge return here. And so mm-hmm. I think we can say economists are helping in that regard. <laughs> yes, yes. We're helpful in that yeah. regard. That's right. Yeah. Let yeah. me, I we're gonna we're gonna run out of time here. So one yeah. final question, really, in terms of You've been working on this area for a long time. Is there anything uh, that has been revealed by the pandemic that surprises you? Is there anything that new in the policy prescription space that comes from thinking about? We know, we certainly know that the pandemic, at least in the United States, has had an extremely uneven effect. It's been a low skill a uh, gender specific, racial specific, all the hits have been on the, all the vulnerable populations that, that mm-hmm. we've been talking about today. So just maybe end with anything new here in terms of our understanding or what we should be doing going forward. I would say this, that I was surprised that people were surprised to learn about how systemic racism and uh, sexism, for example, are. I think I was surprised by that. What I was also surprised by was that in proposing in spring 
uh, 2020 that we stop saying disparities here and disparities there, disparities in this thing and disparities in that outcome. Instead, we should just say systemic racism. <laughs> it's, it's, it's every, if it's everywhere, that means that, that it's systemic. It's and systemic. that change, like economists have been resisting this forever in journals, forever in our language and talking about this forever. Wow. So I think that, that we are persuading with evidence and I think we can make a change for the better, just as you were saying, with evidence mm -hmm. and CEOs can act on having uh, this evidence and everybody can act by having this uh, evidence, this evidence that we, uh, we all can believe. Okay, I think I have uh, one more other question that just came in. If the federal government wants to boost GDP growth, growth by reducing racism, what are the pathways you see as most feasible? So what if we, so if we had a, a federal government says, here's our growth strategy for America. Okay, mm -hmm. and here's our growth strategy for America. We don't, we don't tend to do it that way. Um, other <laughs> some other, right, right, right. other societies right. do do it that way. Right. Uh, uh, but, and we would like to up the growth rate. Uh, and what, mm -hmm. how would you sort of fit in uh, what are the pathways you think would be most feasible, most effective uh, to actually reduce racism? to increase growth? Well, I think one of the easiest things to do would be to follow the recommendations of the EEOC. The EEOC just found, for example, that um, Google was discriminating against women uh, with respect to pay and promotions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, don't wait for the EEOC to come after you. What about just do it? Just, you know, raise, you know, close the gap, look for the gap yourself and, and, and change that. Yeah. You know, again, maximize profit. Can you just maximize profits? I mean, I, I want to follow, I want uh, firms to follow uh, the optimization problem that we say is fundamental in economics. And if you're maximizing the human resources you have, you're not allowing harassment, you're not allowing, um, whether it's uh, racial or gender, you're not allowing that to go forward. And in this period, in the post George Floyd era, we have found out a lot about harassment and poor working conditions for uh, women and for uh, African Americans, for example, and, and for many others. So I think we can find ways to address these problems before the federal government has to step in and say, you're doing this and you're doing this systematically. We have a lot of data we can bring to bear. Fantastic. Well, I think we're, we're, we're uh, slightly oh. over time. So I think I will conclude here, Lisa, but I certainly want to continue the conversation and I'm sure many of our audience really do. It's uh, original research. It's very significant research. It's inspiring research. And uh, let's move on to uh, uh, deal with, as you said, it is a systemic set of, system, of problems and we need to think about it with systemic solutions. Thank you very, very much, Lisa, for joining us. Thank you so much, Laura. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Take Thank care. Thank you everyone. Bye.